This is the new face of Triumph. It shares the almond eyed headlamps of the Daytona and a few more components, but other than that, it's very, very different and very, very new. I also got it very, very dirty. So what have we got? Well, first off, we've got a lot of noise because it's the sound of the rain on this plastic roof because we've had to come undercover because it's absolutely tiddling down out there. But forgetting that for a while and ignoring that hissing, the biggest feature of this Triumph, the thing that probably hits you first, is this massive perimeter beam frame. Aluminium sections ribbed internally to give you extra strength. And they've done that to get rid of the old steel spine frame. Remember, it used to run up from the headstock down to the bottom. You've now got a fuel injected motor. They needed more space for that. And they wanted to make it subtly different from its sexy cousins, the 509 and also the Daytona, which has got those oval tube frames. Looks very nice, but they wanted to make a bit different. Also, they needed to beef it up because this bike will be used a lot for two up touring. So by making it stronger here, you can also put a stronger subframe on. It's retained the sexy one-sided swinging arm, or should I say single-sided swinging arm, from the Daytona, so that's still there. And altogether, it looks the business. Not only that, it also does the business. Coupled to top-notch show of suspension, the handling is superb. Gone is that slightly top-heavy feeling of the old Sprint. This one is flickable, but still rock solid. The wheelbase is 30mm longer than its cousins to aid stability and put a tad more weight over the front end while the fork brake and trail are more leisurely, again to remove any front end twitchiness. Road holding is also spot on, with front and rear suspension beautifully matched. Mind you, it's a good job the handling is up to it, because the engine is an absolute blinder. Now this engine might look familiar and it might sound familiar, but it is very different internally. It's got cast pistons instead of forged pistons because the engine is less stressed than the Daytona. It's got steel liners in the barrels instead of a coated aluminium, which is what the Daytona's got. And again, because this one is less stressed. It's got softer cams, not soft in a squidgy fashion, but a softer profile to give a broader spread of power. The electronic engine management system, that has been remapped, again, to give a more flexible engine, a more rounded engine. On top of that, behind the barrels down here, it's got a suppression block. This is a block that's been molded onto the engine to sort of dampen out any vibration and any noises and whirring from the gearbox and from the crankcase in general. Altogether, they've made it a more rounded engine. And what does all this mean? I love this engine. Along with Ducatis and the BFR, it's got character. It's a true biker's engine. You get 108 breakers against 130 on the Daytona, but, and this is where it scores, you get a juicy 72 foot-pounds of torque at just 6,200 revs. Lovely. But there's more to it than that. It's spread right through to the 9,200 red line. That translates into instant zapping. No matter which of the six gears you're in, it just goes and goes and goes. Effortless is one word for it. Yes is another. And a much better one too. And talking about gears, what a beaut this gearbox is. Snicking in and out without a glitch, you could be forgiven for changing gear just to hear that triple howling away. The riding position is just right. A slight forward pitch, lowish footrests, and a very effective fairing. However, as a six foot tour, personally, I'd like a slightly taller screen. But what about the other creature comforts? First off, the front forks, adjustable for preload, they're 43 mm stanchions, unlike the 45s of the Daytonas. Down at the bottom end, you've got the four-pot Nissan calipers, straight off the Daytona, 320mm discs, no problem there. Coming back up onto the top yokes, you can see a very neat handlebar layout here with all the standard controls on, on the um, twist grip and on the clutch side. The levers are adjustable for span, as you'd expect. Switching on the ignition and looking at the dash panel here, you get a nice little row of lights there. If you put the headlight on, you can see up there the main beam warning light is very bright. Not too bad in this light, but believe me, at night that is incredibly bright and a bit of a distraction. What isn't a distraction, but perhaps should be, is the Speedo. Speedo and rev counter here. Personally, I think the Speedo should be there and rev counter over on the left. A white face rev counter, dead easy to see. But at night, that speedo, especially with a red pointer, is very, very difficult to see how fast you're going. And that's the one that's going to lose your license, not the rev counter. 
Coming up here, a couple of gauges here, fuel gauge and temperature gauge, and you've also got a digital clock buried down in that little hole. You've also got a low fuel warning light, because the gauge is all very well, but it is nice to have that little light that's going to tell you when you're really, really low. Another neat touch, very VFR-like, is these mirrors. They fold back in either direction, so if you've got to go in the shed or between some uh, cars, you can always fold the mirrors back. But very, very neat, that, with these rubber boots over it. Moving back from the front, you can see this very, very curvaceous fuel tank, 21 litres, and at 45 to the gallon, you get a hell of a range. Very nice plastic tank, of course, in Triumph um, tradition. Nice big dual seat here, and you can see the fixing points there for a little tail hump, colour-coded, clicks on there, removable, so removable that Triumph didn't give me one. You can fit pannier frames here and detachable panniers. They're colour-coded as well to match the bike. Looks very, very neat. And the exhaust system, the silencer, just like a Ducati ST4, can swivel out of the way to give you clearance for the panniers or swivel it back up for a bit of clearance for sports riding. And what you mustn't forget, and what all touring bikes should have, if not all bikes in my opinion, is a centre stand. So there it is, a fully equipped sports tourer. So that's it. Two years on from the intro of the 595, we now have the Sprint ST, and it was worth the wait. I know what you're thinking, he raved over the VFR 800 too, so is the Triumph better? Difficult. For me, yes, because I really like that engine, but they are both so good there's very little in it. But make no mistake, this really is a Triumph for Triumph. At £7,995, it's £500 more than the VFR on Honda's special black and white deal. But it's £600 cheaper than a Ducati ST4. Difficult, ain't it?